as deep as the one we're going through without it affecting our culture, of which our religious attitudes are a part. And in my own view, we're likely to see, uh, at least in the near period, an increasing fragmentation of religious belief, with more and more groups springing up, each with their own set of myths, rituals, ideas about reality, uh, that instead of having a few mass religions to which everybody nominally adheres, there's likely to be a proliferation of small uh, cults and groups and, and churches, uh, that some of these will take on political forms, uh, that's, that many of these, in fact, I was just at breakfast reading today, a whole that there is a whole tendency toward a kind of ecology religion which is beginning to spring up as an alternative to the traditional religions. Uh, there are going to be, uh, there's going to be, I think, a spread of sun worship um, based on solar energy and the recognition that the sun is the center of, of energy for our planet and so on. So I think that there are important implications for religion and particularly for organized religion in what's happening and that the, if one were to take a survey of uh, religious views 20 years from today or 30 years from today among Americans, Europeans, and so on, uh, at asking them about their religious beliefs, they, I think, would be quite different from those today. Is it a return to idol worship or paganism? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what one would call it. I think it's a... Uh, in general, a move away from the fairly standardized forms of Christianity and Judaism. How do Eastern values and futurism relate? Uh, I have to bear my soul here and confess that I'm essentially pretty much a Western rational creature, a product of uh, Western scientific rationalism. Uh, my, my feeling, though, is that you can't really think intelligently about the future, or about anything else for that matter, but certainly not about the future, uh, unless you think outside your own culture, unless you are not strictly uh, ethnocentric. And that suggests to me that if I want to know what's, what's happening and what potentials there are for the human race and what directions we might go in, I want to know something about how other people view reality as well as myself and my own group. Um, I, I personally, as an individual, don't get much out of Eastern mysticism or any kind of mysticism. Uh, there are other people, of course, and good friends of mine who do and feel that this is uh, quite valuable. What I think really what's happening, I guess this is the way to, uh, that I would frame it, I would say that the rise of, of interest in Eastern religions and Eastern mysticism is one stream uh, among many streams of criticism of industrial society. They're basically uh, alternatives, holding up alternatives to industrial society and to the reality that we all uh, know here. And that um, uh, it's valuable to hold up a, 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 a view of the society or a view of the world which is radically different from the one that everybody is in because it gives us a, a kind of perspective on what we are. And in that sense, uh, uh, I think it's a valuable experience we're going through. Yeah. Uh, the question is, a big difference between East and West has to do with cause and effect, and what would my attitude be? Uh, I think that causality uh, has, that, that we in the West have operated within a very narrow framework, that is, our views of causality have been very mechanical and limited. Uh, that's not to say that the East has the answers to the question either. Uh, my own view is that uh, anybody who thinks in terms of uni-causality or, or unilinear causality is in, is in for trouble. Uh, that we live in a weave or webwork of, of uh, forces um, and that it is frequently uh, either impossible or uh, misleading 
to search for the cause that triggered the effect. Uh, cause and effect are, are the Western idea of what is a cause and what is effect is based on certain underlying, implicit, and f most of the time undiscussed assumptions about time. Uh, we in the West have grown up believing that time is a straight line. It's like a highway, and we move toward the future by marching down that highway, or the future moves toward us, but it's in a straight line. Uh, many many non-industrial cultures, not just in the East, have a totally different view of time. They see time as circular, and this, this, this view of time arises, I think, primarily out of an agricultural culture which is based on the rhythms of nature. And so they see the repetition of things. And of course, um, in India, there is the, the cyclical notion of reincarnation and so on. Uh, there are, however, alternatives to either a linear view or a circular view. There are many, many different ways to conceive of time. And, un and once you determine what you think, that is, you cannot really get at the, co the question of causality until you have dealt with the question of time. Uh, did you hear that? Uh, the question is, uh, uh, referring to last night when I talked about the breakup of the melting pot, um, is there a potential for violence? Is it likely that there will be violence in the transition from industrialism to superindustrialism? Doesn't the breakup of, of uniformity suggest conflict? I guess that's really what the question is. Uh, my feeling is, first of all, diversity need not mean conflict. One could argue the reverse of that as well. For example, if two of us are alike, it means we want the same things. And if those things are in short supply, we're going to fight over them. In fact, we are all alike in certain respects. We need food, okay? And we will fight over food if necessary to get it. If we're different, if we are diverse, then the things we value are diverse, and it is more possible to create symbiotic relationships. So that diversity does not necessarily imply conflict. That's theoretical, however. And in reality, I, I think that there will be a great deal of conflict, not necessarily ethnic conflict. That's only one level of, of variety. There's also subcultural differences and age differences and professional and occup occupational differences and national and regional differences. Not, not, I mean, the ethnic dimension is only one of many, many dimensions along which we're uh, diversifying. And I believe there is likely to be conflict, primarily because the political institutions that we have were not designed for coping with high diversity. They were designed for coping with a mass society in which there are relatively few identifiable blocks which have to be maneuvered or manipulated into relationships. Now those blocks are breaking down. It's impossible to speak of the working class or the, or the capitalist class or, or blacks or, uh, or uh, urban populations in those terms because each of those categories is itself extremely diverse. It's made up of extremely diverse subcategories. And uh, as a consequence of that, the whole political problem of resolving conflict in the society is escalated given institutions which were designed for uh, very simple kinds of relationships. We have essentially a majority rule society in which 51% of the votes takes all. And that leaves very little room for minority representation or participation. I think that's going to have to change if, we ha if we're to deal with high levels of diversity in the society. The 51% takes all is, I think, a, an inappropriate mechanism for a high diversity civilization. And that's not to say that there's something wrong or that we want minorities to rule. 
but I think we're going to have to have a system in which minorities are much better represented than they are at present. And changing minorities, this time it's this group, next time it's that group. Short of that, and we don't yet have that, I think there will be extreme uh, tension and perhaps considerable violence in this transition. <laughs> After all, we're talking about uh, not just a political change, we're talking about a social transformation on the scale of the industrial, re even, even perhaps larger than the industrial revolution and the Neolithic revolution. Well, those major historic transformations did not take place without violence. Uh, the industrial revolution was, was a bloody revolution in many places. And, and triggered all sorts of uh, upsets and upheavals. And I think that uh, this is true of all major social and cultural upheavals. And so that I would not at all be surprised to see a, a degree of violence in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. And it seems to me our task is to try as best we can to anticipate those tensions and try to deal with them before they become violent, to try to smooth that transition but I think it probably would be naive to think that we can make the leap from industrial society to super-industrial society in a purely peaceful and smooth fashion. That's asking too much. Uh, the shift from feudalism to industrialism uh, was a smaller shift than the one I think we're about to make, and that was not done that smoothly. How do I feel about religion's answers to questions like who am I, where am I going, and where, what my value should be? Well, first of all, the one question has to be is what religion are we talking about? Uh, I think there is no, I think there is no single, single answer to that question. Uh, my own feeling runs something like this, as I think I said last night, or at least I did in, uh, after the session. I personally am not religious in any conventional sense. I have never... I've never believed in a supreme being. I've never felt the need to do so. On the other hand, lots of people do, and they get some, something of value out of that. My feeling is that religious institutions or religions can be very helpful in, a, in, the period, in this period of extreme turbulence and change and diversity to the degree that they sensitize us to the implications of our own value systems. That is, uh, to the, any institution, whether it's a school or a religion or any other institution, which helps us to think deeply about our values uh, and to recognize the implications of our values uh, can, is a very helpful, adaptive institution. It does something very valuable for us. But that's quite different from an institution that says, this is what your values should be, A, B, C. That's the imposition of a set of values, and is different from uh, a, a, um, an institution which helps one clarify one's own values, whatever those values may be. So I think that uh, I would personally make a distinction between religions which impose um, very neat and, sim and, in my view, probably simplistic values, and those which simply help their adherents to examine their own values. What alternatives do I see to the worldwide food crisis? I wish I knew. Well, for one thing, I think, um, I mean, there the problems are the problems are extremely uh, you know, obviously uh, they're, they're of tragic dimension. Uh, there is no sign as yet that the rich countries are about to cut their own consumption to make it possible for other people to survive. Uh, I've, I've been thinking of uh, appealing to the Catholic Church to reinstitute meatless Fridays. It seems to me that would be a good thing. <laughs> I would like the Catholic Church to reinstitute meatless Fridays and to do away with their opposition to birth control. <laughs> if, if they could swap those two, I'd be very happy. Uh, that's a, um, uh, you know, that's, that, that's not a, uh, by any means a satisfying answer to the problem. But I, but I think that we are going to have to at least for a period, begin to move down the food chain ourselves and eat 
less energy. And um, we're going, that, that, that is, it's very hard to get people to change their uh, food cultural, uh, their food culture, very difficult, but it can be done. Uh, for example, in Japan, uh, after, well, in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, the, uh, the Japanese did not eat beef until then. Beef was introduced as a Western dish and then spread through Japan. And now beef consumption is very high in Japan. You have uh, beef sukiyaki and beef shabu shabu and beef everything, not to mention uh, hibachi steak and so on. So there's a lot of meat consumption in Japan, and there was an example of a, of a substantial shift. Now, uh, we are going to have to make a substantial shift in the kind of foods that we use and in the amounts. Uh, there are all sorts of small and almost symbolic things that can do. I have been thinking of trying to get the airlines. Uh, I, I would be very happy to make a deal. I spend a lot of time on airplanes. And the airplanes, uh, particularly the transcontinental ones, stuff you with food because they want to keep you soporific. And uh, uh, I, would, uh, I would propose to the airlines that uh, any passenger, that they make a, an arrangement under which any passenger who willingly gives up a meal, that that money will, or that meal will be uh, not wasted, but in fact contributed to some international agency. But over the long pull, these are, this is, this is sort of, uh, you know, putting, uh, it's putting band-aids on a, on a gaping wound. And um, I think that there has to be some international uh, reserve system, which is now being discussed, a kind of uh, granary system which permits uh, us to even out the flow from year to year. There need to be emergency um, programs for various places. Uh, and even with all of that, there obviously has to be some kind of change in the population statistics. Now, I know that the uh, Red Chinese don't agree with that and that there are some very hard left people who think that this is an anti-humanitarian attitude. Uh, their attitude, it's really funny, I was just reading a, um, a, an extreme uh, uh, left-wing publication on the way out here in which they take the position that it is genocide to speak of uh, population control. Uh, that is just a terribly nasty thing to do because man, uh, mankind or the human race, uh, including womankind, can do anything. That the, that the reason there isn't enough food to go around is capitalism or bad political structures and not a real shortage. And that if we really try, we can feed an infinite number of people. Uh, I find that a peculiarly non-Marxist view because uh, it's, a, it's a rather idealistic, it's what Marx would have called an uh, idealism, uh, thinking that it's a kind of mind over matter, that there are no objective constraints on the situation. Uh, there are objective constraints, I believe, and I think that uh, what's, I think there's going to be a fundamental redistribution on the face of the planet, as I said last night, or began to say last night, and that that's going to mean a, uh, a considerable improvement for many, many people in the third world, uh, but probably large uh, patches or areas where the, where the future is, is a non-future. The question is, if, if uh, large numbers of people are unprepared for the future, isn't this the responsibility of education? And it, doesn't it arise from the fact that educators themselves are not educated about what's happening? And I think that that's not an unfair statement. That, you know, in a society, everybody has uh, their social roles and obligations and pressures and so on. And uh, the role of teacher, the role of, of educator in our society also has certain pressures and constraints built into it. And that role that has been given to educators in our society, by and large, is, um, has constrained them. Uh, I think that 
by the way, if you see me waving my hand like this, it's not because I'm crazy, it's because there's a fly bothering me. <laughs> um, I, I think that the whole, uh, educators have seen themselves as transmitters of, of information, transmitters of knowledge. Uh, ever since the 19th century, that knowledge has been organized in a certain set of disciplines um, that locks, uh, as a consequence, before I go on, as a consequence of that, your, your institutions have departments. You've got a department of biology and a department of economics and a department of this and a department of that. Budgets are distributed according to those departmental lines. And there are all sorts of economic rewards and professional rewards and so on, which, in effect, uh, pay off educators for certain forms of, of teaching, certain forms of behavior. The system does not, by and large, reward educators for thinking much about the future and uh, or for stepping outside their disciplinary bounds and trying to take a more holistic or, or systems view of matters. And I think that uh, it's not fair, however, to blame educators entirely uh, particularly when we're talking, we're not. Uh, this is not a group of primary school children we're talking to, we're talking to adults. Uh, if there's something wrong with your education, one thing to do about it is do something yourself. And that is, one, one cannot simply say, I'm being badly educated because some other people are, are not giving me an adequate uh, education. If, I, if I'm far enough along to recognize that as a problem, I'm far enough along to take some action on my own take some initiatives of my own. And uh, I think that that's perfectly feasible, perfectly doable uh, in, in our, there's nothing to stop students, for example, from organizing their own curricula. If they have to go through, jump through the hurdles and hoops of the conventional uh, curriculum, okay. There's nothing to prevent you from designing your own para-curriculum for groups or individuals simultaneously, and from working to change the structure of the institution itself so that it is more adequate. So I think that uh, it's not uh, that that, the, that there is a need for student initiative, uh, rather than simply a, uh, a student response to what's given out. In the back, I can't, I can't hear you. What role have the large corporations and conglomerates uh, played in the revolution we're going through? Well, clearly, they have been uh, very influential in at least one uh, way. They have contributed uh, and, in fact, to a considerable degree controlled technological development. And the, much of the change that we're talking about is related to or a product of technological uh, change. So in that sense, corporations have had a significant impact. Moreover, uh, corporations, and when I say corporations, I include uh, socialist corporations, uh, Russian uh, productivity uh, uh, enterprises and so forth. Uh, as I, as um, it seems quite clear to me that whether you're talking about a socialist enterprise or a, uh, or a, um, a, an American private, so-called private corporation, uh, all of these have contributed to spreading industrialism around the world, to spreading the money system around the world, and to the col and to colonialism. That is, they we the industrial countries have been the ad uh, the beneficiaries of cheap resources taken from all over the world, and our large uh, enterprises, regardless of their political structure have been the agencies for carrying that out and imposing that. And I think they're going to be in deep trouble. Moreover, I think there's going to be a change in the control of our major corporations uh, and enterprises. I think there's going to be much more social pressure on them, much more political pressure on them. And indeed, uh, in Europe, we're beginning to see uh, the, why, the, the spread of demands for worker participation and management. I think we're going to see a lot of that. I think we're going to see that here as well. And so that the control of large, large corporate uh, enterprises is not any longer going to remain in the hands of those who have it. And that doesn't mean necessarily a, uh, a, a sort of bloody old-style socialist or communist revolution. It means the emergence of totally new forms of self-management and uh, community responsibility. 
and that um, uh, the production enterprise, which we call a corporation, uh, to, I mean, to summarize, therefore, is a central piece of this scenario, and something. Uh, I mean, it, it is not going to escape the next twenty or thirty years unscathed. And the companies that we now have, they some of them may still survive and have the same names then, but they're not going to be the same. Moreover, even without those kinds of external political pressures, corporations are already changing. They're changing their internal structures as, of, as a matter of necessity. They cannot continue to carry out even the roles that they assign themselves, given the old traditional internal organizational structures. So they are changing and will, I think, continue to change and will, and that some sort of corporation of the future will emerge, which will be quite, quite different from the ones we now know. Do I see our, our transition to the future requiring a fundamental revision of such terms as generosity, mercy, and what was the other? Selfishness, and so on. Well, I, I would, um, I think that this hinges on the notion of individualism. It has a lot to do with the idea of individualism. And we, for the past 500 years in the West, have made a very big virtue of extreme individualism. Uh, the arts, our literature, and so on, have all fostered the image of the total, uh, totally independent, autonomous individual. And what's happening now, it seems to me, the push toward diversity is in fact enhancing our individuality. But I think we need a much deeper view of what it means to be an individual. And I think that, for me, one cannot be, it's a, it's a kind of dialectical uh, question. I don't believe one can be a full individual without at the same time being part of some community or part of some collectivity, if you want to call it that. And that in that sense, you know, apart from Robinson Crusoe, as soon as Friday arrived, he was part of a, of a larger group as well. But for, you know, in practical terms, each of us as an individual is part of some larger social uh, grouping. And that means that one's individuality must necessarily be tempered by that and should be tempered by that. And so when we talk about the wholly autonomous individual, if we're speaking about somebody who just operates from within, uh, that's a myth. That can't be. People operate in response to outside pressures and uh, influences as well. Now, selfishness is selfishness is really the expression of that kind of unbridled individuality, a kind of e egotistic individuality, saying, "Damn everybody else, I get what I want." I think that that's very much based on power relationships. Who gets the? Who has the power? He who has the power gets what he or she wants. Um, and that those relationships are necessarily going to change. Uh, there's a, I, I really don't have a, uh, you know, a very clearly, uh, clear line on the issue. I'm just thinking and speculating about it. There's a, there's a man by the name of Irving Buchan who has an essay in Learning for Tomorrow, this book of mine on education, in which he suggests that we've reached the limits of individual, that the limits of growth imply the limits of individuality as well. Uh, and uh, that there is a relationship between resources, energy, and individuality. And that's an interesting idea. Uh, that's two very different questions. <laughs> I can dispose of the, the last one more quickly and easily. Uh, I am a political person, but that doesn't mean I'm a candidate or I'm an active political uh, entity. I'm not running for office and I don't think I ever will. It's not my style. I, would, I don't think I'd be very good at it, uh, aside from which my wife would assassinate me before the voters would. <laughs> but uh, that's not, uh, that doesn't mean that I'm non-political. I think what I'm saying is, in a very broad and philosophical sense, quite political. 
and suggests a whole set of, of uh, political needs or, or steps that need to be taken, and I regard that as a, as a political role, an important political role to play, uh, not just for myself, but for many people. Um, I've had long discussions with uh, others who, other fairly well-known writers, for example, who have wanted to go into politics. And uh, we've discussed it and come to the conclusion for some people that the ro their role outside politics can be much more influential than inside the system. So, so much for that. As for nations, basically I believe that the nation is no longer the most appropriate container for the kind of power that we've given to the nation until now. I think that power is going to move down to regions and communities and up to various kinds of supranational agencies. There, there will have to be uh, regional and interest groupings uh, at the national, uh, you know, at the supranational level, and that these will become more and more important as time goes by. But that does not mean the creation of kind of supra governments. Uh, the idea that the common market will become one government, one political entity for all of Europe, the United States of Europe, seems to me to be a kind of backward idea which moves political control further away from the people and moves it up to yet another stage. I think instead that th we will have to create a network of regulatory agencies and associations of one kind or another that girdle the globe, that create a very uh, a kind of integument around the, an organizational integument around the planet, uh, controlling the oceans, space, ecological problems, uh, preventing certain kinds of weather modification, uh, controlling or regulating uh, the kinds of, of uh, genetic engineering that might or might not be permissible, not to mention all sorts of more homely things like travel arrangements and so on. And that such uh, this, this network of international agencies and organizations is springing up very, very rapidly. It already, uh, it already exists and is proliferating at a, at a rapid pace. And so it seems to me that in the end what that will mean is much greater constraint on individual nations. Nations will be forced to modify their behavior by the out by outside pressures, but those outside pressures need not necessarily take the simple, the simplistic form of a single world government. I'm afraid I missed the first sentence. Do I see an end to what? Oh, to the energy crisis and what solutions are there to it? Yes, I see an end to the energy crisis. Uh, I think that what will happen is that we will skin through somehow or other over the next 10, 20, 30 years, and that in that time we will make a transition to new energy forms. That we will, that what's going to happen is that just as we are diversifying our people and our culture, we will diversify our energy sources. Right now, we have all of our, basically, all of our eggs in one fossil fuel basket. And I think we're going to develop a wide variety of alternative energy sources for different purposes that probably we, we will not use fossil fuels uh, to burn for power, the, uh, if oil that is, to burn for power the way we now do. We'll save it for other things. We will probably move toward uh, tidal power, geothermal power, solar for certain uses and so forth so that at the end of the line we will not be totally dependent on a single energy for, uh, uh, form. We will have a variety of forms. Uh, then, and in that mix, there may or may not be some kind of nuclear fusion uh, or other kinds of uh, other, other, other for, uh, forms. But between here and there is a long, long way, and it's going to be a very painful way for us. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, it was a joke when Nixon said the energy crisis is over. He did us more disservice with that, perhaps, than he did with Watergate.
Uh, the question is, um, uh, with respect to the possibility of greater citizen participation, what forms will it take and what does one do about the problems of apathy? Well, A, for apathy, um, I think apathy vanishes rapidly in the midst of pressure and that we're moving into a period when there's going to be extreme economic and other kinds of pressure on people and that we're then going to see, instead of a, a lull in our political lives, a kind of depressed uh, uh, privatism with everybody doing his own thing and ignoring the political scene, I think we're going to see an enormous intensification of political, political action of one kind or another in the country, and that our, we're then going to look around and say, we're all the apathetic people. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily suggest an orderly or um, uh, really, uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily suggest an advance in participation. There are some, f some participatory forms that I think we can discuss that are possi possibilities and some which are already realities. I don't know if you're aware of some of the projects that have gone on and are going on now in the United States uh, in which there are, which are essentially experiments with citizen participation in formulating goals for the future. Uh, in 1970, in fact, the week Future Shock came out, and quite independently of Future Shock, the state of Hawaii held a conference called Hawaii 2000. And at this meeting, it was called by the governor, Governor Burns. At this meeting, they brought together 700 representatives of the community, or just a broad cross-section of the community, truck drivers, students, uh, farm workers, trade unionists, businessmen, uh, church people, and so forth and so on. And they spent the week talking about things like, what should the rural-urban balance be in Hawaii in the year 2000? How much tourism should we permit in Hawaii in the next 20 or 30 years? What about education? What about transportation systems, resources, ecology, and so forth? That meeting so stirred up the state that it has since been replicated at county and township levels throughout Hawaii, and it is also now being accompanied by similar uh, uh, pro uh, uh, processes at functional levels. For example, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court sponsored a meeting essentially on the future of law and order in Hawaii and the future of the penal system. The business community is working on the economy of the year 2000 for Hawaii. Now, that idea has subsequently been taken up by many, many other states. Iowa, right nearby, just recently completed a year project on Iowa 2000 in which they reversed the Hawaii procedure. Hawaii began with a statewide meeting and then moved down to the localities. Iowa began at the localities and moved up to the statewide level and it worked like this. Last year there were between 1,500 and 1,800 local meetings in Iowa involving 35 to 50,000 people in discussions of Iowa in the year 2000. That then moved up to regional meetings, and in June there was a statewide conference on this. Out of that conference came a series of recommendations, some of which are now being embodied in the, in the political platforms of the political parties and various candidates. So that is one model. An, an alternative model, which has been tried in New York and in other places, has to do with the use of the media for involving people. In New York, some, an organization called the Regional Planning Association uh, made an arrangement. This was a very large and ambitious program. It had many weaknesses as things about the program I didn't like, but the basic idea was an interesting and good one. They made a, an arrangement with 18 television stations in the greater New York region, including New Jersey and Connecticut. Each of those stations promised to give six hours of programming time to the project. The project then produced six one-hour television programs on the future of the region. And the programs took the form of presenting alternatives. Is this the kind of transportation system you want, or is that the kind of transportation system you want? Is this the kind of housing program, or is that the kind of housing program? They then made an arrangement with 24 newspapers in the region to print ballots permitting viewers to vote on the alternatives presented to them. Now, that is one form, uh, another form, another model of citizen participation, 
which makes use of the media in a feedback way. There were lots of, as I say, there were lots of things wrong with that, the way that was organized. I think they use a horizon of 1976, which is much too close in to be terribly helpful, I think. Uh, they also didn't give viewers the opportunity to suggest alternatives. They, you had to either say yes to A or yes to B. You couldn't say, no, I want C. So there were weaknesses in the way it was organized. But the idea of linking the media uh, into feedback systems to permit citizen participation, I think we'll see a lot more of. Another move in the same direction toward uh, democratization and participation is the push that I described or referred to a moment ago toward worker participation in management, which is now spreading all over Europe and which is going to come here before long, in which trade unions and workers in general say, okay, we spend our lives working for this company. We have a right to, make, to participate in making the decisions about what its new products ought to be, whether it ought to put up a plant here or there, what, what investments it should make, and so on. And before long, I believe consumers are going to demand the right to sit in on those kinds of decisions as well. That's another development. Uh, at a different level, we're seeing a push in Washington toward more power for Congress and some at least minor uh, restraint on the White House. I think that's good news for us and that that is essentially a move toward uh, a more participatory system, given all the weaknesses of Congress. The more power concentrated in the executive, the less control the citizen has over that system, in my opinion. So at the level of change in Congress, at the level of industrial relationships, um, in these anticipatory democracy experiments around the country, you begin to see hints of a future system involving participation in many different ways. Now, what actually will come out, who knows? We don't know. Uh, I'm sure that we will invent many additional forms and many stronger forms that are uh, at, available at present. But I believe that there is going to be an enormous push and an enormous a period of political creativity in which we invent new participatory mechanisms. And I would like that to be on the agenda for all of us that we ought to be thinking about how to do that, not just at the level of the nation, but even within the institutions we're a part of. To what degree do you participate in shaping the policy of Ball State University? And shouldn't you? I think you should. And there ought to be some interesting mechanisms for how to do that. So I, I, what kind of time frame do I see for, the, for these various changes I'm talking about? Uh, generally speaking, you know, I don't think anybody can put a time date on, no, nobody can predict the future, least of all can I. But looking at events today and, and inferring from them, it seems to me that we're talking about a 20, 30, 40 year period, not 500 years. We're talking about our own generation and that uh, during this time there will have to, there are going to have to be very substantial changes including changes in our political system and uh, uh, you referred to the constitution and i think that's one of the things that probably is going to be changed and again what i'm saying about the united states applies to england france japan and so forth it seems to me naive to believe that we can get through the next 20 30 of uh, years of extreme turbulence with the same obsolete political machinery which was designed for a quite different set of circumstances and which fu function magnificently well for those other circumstances but is not functioning terribly well for now. And I've proposed many times uh, on platforms like this that one of the things we ought to be doing is instead of, um, instead of worrying about uh, who is going to be the candidate for 1976, that we take some time to design 50 alternative constitutions for the United States uh, and throw those into the political hopper for widespread discussion so we can begin to think more deeply and more structurally about the political institutions of the future before uh, there is the kind of crisis that will impose them on us. Yeah, what's my opinion of B.F. Skinner and other behaviors as social planners? Well, I have, I have reservations about them. Um, I mean, I, I think you cannot deny 
I think it would be foolish for any of us to deny that you can condition you know, animals or people to do things. Uh, I was just at a university in Texas in San Marcos, and um, uh, there there is a very unusual place called Acarina Springs. I don't know if any of you here from Texas or, or if you know about this place. It was a complete surprise for me to find it. I checked into a hotel. The university put me into a, into a hotel, which was quite beautiful, set on a lagoon, and part of a sort of amusement park. Uh, and in the morning, when I went out for breakfast, I w uh, there was a, uh, a sort of reconstructed historical Texas village. And in one building at the corner, by God, you went inside, and there were chickens in cages. And you put a dime in the slot, and the chickens performed for you. And they had been operant conditioned. And they played basketball for you, and they did all sorts of other things, and it was horrifying to me to see those chickens uh, in those cages. But it's, uh, you know, it would be naive to assume that you can't do things with operant conditioning, uh, and that you can't shape behavior. But whether you can or should try to create a large-scale, complicated civilization uh, based on, I think, rather simple conditioning principles is, I think that's absurd. Uh, the, the kind of, the kind of uh, model that Skinner holds out in Walden II is a super simplistic society. It's not one I'd want to live in. I'd be bored out of my skull in about 30 minutes. Uh, and, it would not, and it does not take into account any of the technology the human race has developed and the ways of using it and so on. It's, it's a model for a very simple reversion to the past rather than a move forward to the future. Way in the back. Would I care to comment on the validity of the assumptions in Charles Reich's Greening of America? Uh, Let's see how to put that most succinctly. I think that Reich made a lot of sensible criticisms of the society, but he then made, I think, a rather naive assumption that consciousness three, that, that, or let's put it this way, that political change, that profound, significant, structural political change is going to come about simply through a change of consciousness that if we all smoke enough grass and relax and look at the sunshine, somehow a revolution is going to happen. I don't think that's the way things are in the real world. I think there, are, there is power and there is conflict and there has to be organization and there have to be counter pressures of one kind or another and out of that comes change. And that uh, uh, there is a kind of, um, well, it's, it's, uh, it's a kind of, dream, I guess, is what I think about the conclusion of the book, and that real life doesn't quite work as easily as that. On the other hand, as I say, many of the, many of the critiques of the society uh, that he made, I think, were valid. Um, I think the significance of the book, and the reason why it was very often linked with my own book is that they both came out virtually simultaneously and both of them apparently um, served as some kind of bridge between the generations at a particular moment and parents would buy the book and give it to their children and children would buy the book and give it to their parents as though using it as a message for intercommunication between the generations and that happened to both the books and, um, and the fact that they both came at the same time and they both were sort of ambassadors between the generations m led people to assume that the two books were essentially saying the same things, which I'm sure Reich would not agree to and I don't agree to. How significant do I think the right to life movement is? Do you mean how strong is it uh, or how proper is it? Well, it's, uh, I don't know how strong it is. Uh, it's obviously not uh, insignificant in the country. Um, 
I have very mixed feelings about this. I am pro-abortion. Um, I am, I think that it is criminal not to allow women to decide how they want to use their own bodies and what they want to do with themselves. And to talk about the right to life uh, is, it's a good propagandistic phrase, but it also may be denying life to women. And so I am, I'm committed on that issue. On the other hand, the issue of life and what is life is a very important issue. And by raising the question of what, how you define life, you see, every society defines life differently. Do you define it from, from birth, from conception, from three months? Where, where, do, you, where do you decide that, uh, that uh, an organism is alive? I think that issue is going to become a very painful and difficult issue for us in the future as a consequence of some of the biological breakthroughs that are coming down the line. And that we're going to have to take very sharp political stands, that, or that we will take, countries will take very sharp political stands on the question of what is life and what is death. That the simple definitions that we've used until now are not valid. And, and the, the fight over abortion highlights all of that for me. Um, and maybe, maybe 50 years from now or 30 years from now, I, given a whole new range of technology, a whole new way, whole new range of techniques for reproduction and so forth, I might take a different position. But right now, I think the right to life is the right to misery for a lot of people. And uh, uh, that... Uh, I, I line myself up on one side of that issue. I think the women's movement is correct in fighting for this and that uh, it ought to be a right. The question is, with respect to uh, various international regulatory agencies, what is to prevent the people in these agencies from uh, developing the same kinds of conflicts that's, that we now have among nations? Well, uh, first off, I never suggested that there wouldn't be conflict. I think conflict, see, conflict isn't necessarily bad. Conflict's a good thing. The world without conflict is a world which is in stasis, which is dead. That's impossible. There will be conflict, and there should be conflict. The question is, can you moderate the conflict? Can you, can you keep it nonviolent? Can you keep it from destroying people and so on? Uh, and my hunch is that while there will be conflict and there'll be lots of uh, uh, clash and, and struggle over these things, that in the end that will be a better system than the nation state system that we now have. And that, uh, the, the, and that the fundamental forces in conflict will not necessarily be quite as geographical as they are now. They may be uh, that, that people, that there may be a lobby all around the world for a particular uh, step or program based not on geography at all, but based on certain social characteristics or cultural characteristics or religious characteristics. Uh, whereas now uh, we are still very much ge geography determined. And that reflects the importance of agriculture. But the, the, uh, in the non-agricultural parts of the world, the continued uh, reliance on geography as an organizing principle seems to me to be a mistake and, and gets us in a lot of trouble. So I don't see, I don't see any diminution in conflict. In fact, uh, I also don't think we're, that the next 30 or 40 years are going to be without war. I think there will be wars in this period. What all, the best we can hope for is that those are that those are quote small wars that they are contained that they don't become nuclear that that they don't uh, uh, become worldwide and so on that's a more realistic hope I think uh, one that we can work for and try to do something for uh, toward than the kind of wispy vague belief that we're going to we're going to end all wars. Well, 
the question is, can I give some picture of what life would be like in a super-industrial society? And while we're moving in that direction, what happens to the uh, countries like Bangladesh? I don't think I can give a very concrete picture of what life would be like in a, in a super-industrial society any more than uh, Francis Bacon, uh, or I don't mean to compare myself with Francis Bacon, but somebody living in his period was, would have been able to uh, give a very textured or concrete picture of what life was going to be like in Detroit in, uh, in 1950. Uh, I think that in general what we're talking about is uh, a society in which there are at, the one, at one level very large-scale regulatory organizations and underneath those lots of very much smaller organizations than, and factories and enterprises than we now have that people will find ways, either on the basis of geography or on the basis of, of uh, communications media, to surround themselves with friendships and, and relationships of value. That people will demand the right to participate, be demanding the right to participate more in the decisions that shape at least certain critical aspects of their lives, if not everything. Um, those are all very vague propositions. You know, what is it, what is it going to be like to get up in the morning uh, and to uh, go through a day? I don't know. Particularly difficult because I don't think there's going to be one standard way of doing it. I, don't, I mean, it, would, it might have been possible in, uh, in 1900 to say, as we were moving into the industrial era, that if we found the, that the typical, or let's say 1940, that the typical American was the auto worker who worked in South Bend or in Detroit. And then you could say, well, that's what life is like in these United States. Well, it, it, you couldn't have said that even then. And if we're moving into a society which is going to be dramatically diversified, I don't think it's going to be possible to find that average lifestyle. And that's one that makes it extremely difficult to speculate about what life is going to be like. Life for whom? For what kind of person? What kind of occupation? What social class? What community? Uh, it, it, it is not going to be easy to draw an across-the-board characterization the way we have in the past. And if that's ducking out on the issue, it is. <laughs> oh, Bangladesh. Well, I've, I've, again, I have to apologize to those of you who perhaps heard me say some of this last night because I don't recall now what I said in the main hall and what I said in the private discussions afterwards. But I think that we're going to see a change in the relationship of the poor countries to the rich countries, that the poor countries are going to find new power, that they're going to be able to exercise leverage against the rich countries in ways that were never possible before, and that there is then, therefore, over a long period of time, going to have to be some redistribution take place. Now, that is not going to be an even process. Some countries, some of the third world countries, will come out of this much better off than they were. Others may not at all. And Bangladesh has a, a poor prognosis. I was in India at the Bangladesh border when the refugees were pouring over at the rate of, of millions every month and I interviewed some of them and, and I've never been quite as shattered by anything I've seen in my life. I saw them living in sewer pipe cities that stretched as far as the eye could see and I talked with them and I've been, I was shaken by, by it. But Bangladesh is almost an example of a world pushing its luck. It's a, it's, a, it's a country whose people live on such marginal, marginally, uh, on such marginal ecology that the slightest flood, the slightest, the slightest storm, the slightest interruption of a natural kind, let alone a political or military kind, creates absolute devastation for them because they're just on the border of survival anyway. And um, I therefore don't see any easy and happy future for Bangladesh. I did uh, at one time try to start a project. <clears throat> I wanted to put together a project with Bangladeshis and with futurists to talk about six alternative pathways for development for a country like Bangladesh. 
but the resources are so limited to begin with that you can't you can scarcely get something as as abstract as that off the ground when people are still struggling for the next meal yes uh, when I said that poor countries will have leverage what did I mean by that well first of all the lesson of the Arab oil embargo has not even yet registered either on us or on others I think I think that poor countries that there will be many more resource cartels of one kind or another which will which will embargo us and pressure us and we will start paying more for the resources we get but that's only the beginning I think that there are very imaginative ways in which outside in which third world countries could if they so decided screw up our economy our economies are so tightly woven and so finely stretched and so um, vulnerable that if I were halfway imaginative and ruthless and sitting in a country around the world where I was hungry and you were rich I could find ways I believe to put extreme pressure on your cities on your power systems on your transport systems on your economy and extort certain changes from you if necessary and I think that will happen and I think it's good that it will happen I, I, I can't quite hear you have the media contributed to the fragmentation of industrial society in, in a significant way uh, I think they have contributed uh, but not intentionally I think that most of what the media do they do unintentionally the things that that the media accomplish intentionally are I think like five percent of what's really happening the things they accomplish unintentionally are the are frequently the more important things by that I mean the following a um, they have contributed to further despite uh, and this flies in the face of a lot of conventional social science criticism which looks at the media as essentially standardizing uh, I think the media have also played a very individualizing role in the following way I can only quote a brilliant psychologist friend of mine named Herb Gerjoy at State University of New York who tells the, uh, explains it this way he says a hundred years ago a kid growing up in the United States had very few contacts with other human beings outside his family his village in, in school he maybe had one or two teachers in an entire career um, very few storekeepers ministers doctors that he ever got to meet now each each of these people represents a potential role model a potential uh, model that the individual can emulate or imitate in his or her life with the coming of the media we fantastically multiplied the number of potential role models 